Thanks for coming. And what I'd like to do tonight is start a little broad and talk about uh, how the world has changed a bit with respect to biodiversity on, in birds in particular, which leads us to basically uh, the fact that crows have increased and are doing quite well in our new world. Uh, and I will show you some graphs. So there'll be some numbers. I'll also show you some videos so you can uh, you know, zone in and out as, as you need. But uh, if, if things aren't clear, I'm glad to answer questions at the end and, and hear perhaps some uh, of the adventures you've had with crows and ravens yourself uh, after you see some of the things that, that others have told, told me as well. So th this image, it, it's dark, but what it shows is the earth at night. And what's illuminated are the energy centers really of the earth uh, reflected here in our, uh, our light consumption and, and emission. And basically, Canada looks pretty nice up there from a biodiversity standpoint. It's fairly dark, which, which would indicate a fairly light human footprint on it. But it's creeping. There is a lot of light creeping up from uh, the Midwest up, through the, uh, up to this part of Canada as well. And the general pattern of this influence on Earth is that the northern hemisphere is heavily um, urbanized, and the coasts throughout the world really are quite heavily urbanized. And there's an awful lot of other urban area out there, developed area, that, that's not emitting a lot of light, but still is perhaps affecting the habitat, the food sources, the predator communities, and lots of other aspects of the natural ecosystems that affect the animals and plants that live there. And we've been looking at that in the Seattle area, and I just want to share a little bit of this with you. Uh, what we've done in Seattle uh, is to just select a variety of sites, and those are the little squares that are shown on this map of the Puget Sound in Seattle and Lake Washington there. And we've selected sites, and within those we go in and count birds and catch them and mark them and follow their survivorship and reproduction. And what we found in this respect is that if you just tally up the biodiversity from the bird's uh, perspective, it doesn't simply decrease with urbanization. So here, the number of bird species that we detect is shown on the y-axis, and the percentage of forest, which is the inverse, basically, of the percent that's urbanized, uh, is increasing forest to the, um, to the right here on the x-axis. And so what it suggests is that where there's a lot of forest, well, there's a fair number of bird diversity, fair amount, but it's not as high as where there's an intermediate amount, a, a middle ground of subdivisions and forests that remain. And that was kind of perplexing at first. As a conservation biologist, I pretty much expected diversity would decline with the increasing urbanization, and we should be worried about that. But in fact, we almost want to celebrate the fact that we've got high diversity in terms of birds, in our um, developed areas of, around the Seattle uh, region. And I think it would be very similar here. We share very similar uh, bird communities. We know that this isn't quite as simple as that. And these three graphs just show you the response of three different groups of birds to that urbanization. So the very top one is what a conservation biologist would expect. And that basically shows that as there isn't much urbanization, uh, on the far right side, there also isn't much loss of native forest species. So we lose species, there's extinction or local extinction, extirpation, of these native forest species like winter wrens, a common bird that we have and you, and you share with us. Uh, we lose those in the areas that have very little forest left, the ones that have uh, high urbanization on the left side of these grass. But what we get is we gain some species. Okay, in the middle there, we gain species that are closely associated with people. Basically, these ones that are around us here, crows and gulls, raccoons, rats, other species, some native, some non-native, uh, increase in response to simply the presence of our settlements. Those are shown in the middle. And then we also get a lot of all native species that use early successional or um, cleared areas that are regrowing disturbed places, but they specialize on using those sorts of things. There's, uh, there's, of course, some woodpeckers that use disturbances in response to fires that come into those, not so much in the urban area, but there are grassland species that use our disturbed areas. There are species that use the berries that grow on the bushes along the edges of our disturbed places. Those species come in in great abundance in this intermediate sort of uh, landscape where there's some development and some uh, undeveloped area. And if you add those three, those three graphs together, you get the graph I just showed you. And that's why we get this higher diversity. So some species are really taking advantage of urbanization, and they're leading to an overall pattern of higher diversity, in terms of birds at least, in our urban areas. 
We expect this to change through time. So these maps just show some projections of how we've expected forest cover to change in the Seattle area. And it's, again, you may be a little ahead of us on this curve, but basically the idea, we used starting uh, computer models in 2003 and ran them to 2027, and what we get is a spread of urban sprawl or urban development from Seattle on the left side of the, the lake there uh, on out into the Cascades, which is the right side of this graph here, right side of these maps, and a concomitant loss of forest. So that pattern we've seen now might change in the next 25 years. And what it will do to some birds that we know are related to that amount of forest is it will increase some, uh, like the American crow shown here, uh, and the blue colors here on the map show where the numbers of crows are going to increase probably fairly dramatically if our idea about what crow habitat is is correct. And it's, crows are pretty easy to predict what their habitat needs are. They like french fries, they like streets and grass, and they like them in close proximity. So as that spreads towards the Cascade Mountains, crow populations will probably do pretty well. Other species, like in this case, the Pacific Slope Flycatcher, but it could be the Wilson's Warbler or it could be the Winter Wren, they're going to decline in a lot of these places as urbanization increases out towards the Cascades. Their numbers are projected to drop considerably. So we're afraid that although we have an interesting pattern now, one that's worth celebrating, I think, in terms of the kinds of diversity that occur in and around your backyards, like Leah said, that's possibly going to be in jeopardy as the urbanization continues and we have much less forest in our area. Right now in Seattle, we have about 60% forest in the average square kilometer of the, of the less built part of the city. But the projections from those models I showed you would take that to about 40%. So although we'll still be in the hump of that curve where diversity of birds will be high, it's going to be closer to the point where that number might drop precipitously with further loss, so further development. I think we're lucky in our, both of our regions here in having extreme mountains close by, lots of large reserves close by. So this, this may not be as bad as we think it could be. Uh, and in fact, I'm, I'm hopeful that it, that it won't be, that we'll still be able to maintain considerable diversity in our built areas here because we have big reserves nearby and we tend to like having trees around us. And that helps promote this sort of diversity that we see. So it's something to keep an eye on, but at least right now, the diversity that occurs where we live is substantial and I think uh, really worth understanding and appreciating. So that's the story. I want to tell you now is moving into appreciating some of this common diversity, this, these common species. For example, ones that are very powerful cultural motivators uh, like the American crow and the common raven. And just as an example, Robert Frost penned a, a short poem here that suggests how his encounter with the crow one day uh, changed his attitude. And as Leah said, Tony, Angel, and I have worked this idea trying to think how the crows and ravens might have influenced our cultures and how in turn we might have influenced their cultures or their socially learned and passed on traditions. So I'm going to bounce around with some of those ideas for you suggest how we think the two species, uh, crow or raven and us, might have influenced one another through time. And the images I'll show you here are ones drawn by Tony, uh, who's an artist in Seattle. He didn't draw these. But, but they are good <laughs> representations. First off, the question I always get first, I already got it at dinner tonight, is what's the difference between a crow and a raven? So I think I should at least set that straight for you because you're fortunate, to have, fortunate enough to have them both here and be able to interact with them here. So crows are a, a smaller of the two. They stand about this high. They don't have red eyes like this guy, but that is, I like the addition. That's kind of nice. <laughs> they probably wish they had red eyes. And uh, they are usually in groups. They are foraging in an urban setting. They're very rarely found far from people. They might be in a wilderness area at a picnic ground or something like that, but they are not out in the wilds uh, far from people because they really utilize our subsidies. They're not strict forest species, which is why their numbers have increased in Seattle and Vancouver uh, fairly recently because we've reduced the amount of forest and we've made more of this open, edgy, juxtaposed, built and non-built environment that crows really take advantage of. So they have, they have increased in response to our reduction of the forest. Ravens, on the other hand, are, are more typically a forest species. They're also typically a species that is found in 
pairs, perhaps a group at, a, at an animal carcass of some sort, but typically in pairs or singly, and in contrast, crows are in small groups of five to ten. They both defend permanent uh, territories. As adults, they mate for life. They uh, invest a lot in the care and raising of their young, and uh, crows and, uh, differ from ravens in having a bit larger family structure that they live within. Often maybe there's two or three young from previous years that remain on the territory with the parents and help rear subsequent young. That doesn't happen uh, in ravens. Ravens defend a territory as a pair and keep everybody else out of it.